I was so excited. I hadn't ever been camping before, so the fact that one of my friends asked me to go with him was amazing itself. He made plans for five other guys to join us as well. The plan was to leave right after classes on Friday evening and drive up to the old abandoned farmhouse, which, in Kansas, aren't too uncommon. This one was special though or so I was told by Riley, my friend that had invited me. He said not only was the house quite large and well held together after many years of vacancy, but very few people know about it, so we were almost certain to be unbothered for the weekend. We would stay all Saturday and come back Sunday morning. At about 6 p.m., the last guy, Seth, I think, finally arrived at the cars. We had a white Suburban from Riley and a small Honda van. Four people rode in the van, while three rode in the Suburban. But the Suburban was also full of all of our junk we planned to bring. We left by around 6.30 and drove for nearly an hour before stopping at some burger place to eat a quick super and shift drivers. After another two hours drive, we arrived at the farmhouse. The farm area was large, empty, and the fence that used to surround it was all in shambles. The house, however, looked very nice. Almost kept. After unpacking most of our things and laying out the blankets on the bed frames still in the house, someone suggested we turn in early so we could go fishing in the morning. Not being a late person myself, I was fine with the idea and after some work, I got everyone else to agree with me. There was only three beds in each of the two rooms, so me, Riley, and some other guy I've never met shared one room, and three other guys shared the other. A guy named Roy decided to take the torn up couch downstairs. I had a bit of trouble falling asleep, a bit uneasy about the whole drafty, creepy, abandoned house thing, but I eventually dozed off unable to stay awake any longer. I woke up to the sound of Riley moving all his crap around. When I was able to open my eyes enough to see my phone scream to see what time it was, it was just after 6.30, so I had to hurry if I wanted to catch anything. I rolled out of bed, grabbed some jeans and a jacket, changed as quickly as I could despite my exhaustion, and grabbed one of three remaining fishing rods. When I got to the pond, Roy, Riley, and two other guys were there. I cast my line in and sat silently, waking up to the rest of them. Over the next hour or so, the other two people made their way to the pond, and everyone had woken up a bit more and were chatting about their restless nights. So which one of you idiots decided to come downstairs last night? Roy shouted over the other voices. I was expecting someone to laugh and give some excuse, but nobody flinched. You're not in any trouble, but it was too dark for me to see your face. Whoever it was, for my own curiosity, who the hell was it? Minutes went by with Roy staring at our faces for any sign of conceal. I decided to speak up and try to figure out who it was. What did they come down for? Did they sleep down there? I don't know. They didn't say anything and I was so tired I dozed back off. Well, what did they do? I asked. I told you. I was tired. All I know is that I saw someone come downstairs, look at me, then I fell back asleep. In fear of getting hit, I held back any further questions. On a positive note of that, Roy packed up and everyone else followed. The fishing was good and we had plenty to eat for today and tonight. We walked back to the field in front of the farmhouse, let over our jackets, and ran out again. Roy had dug up an old frisbee, so we divided into two teams quite sloppily so that we were an uneven pair four against three. We played for maybe an hour when we switched to baseball. Then some guys started playing poker on the grass and I sat out, 
Some dude I never met, Joel was his name, I believe, came out and sat next to me on the porch steps. Why didn't anyone wake me up? He asked clearly, irritated. I woke up almost and still beat two people to the fishing, plus you made it anyways, I responded. I just woke up a half an hour ago, he irritated tone now turning to confusion. Shut up. You went fishing with us. And I know sure as hell you weren't playing ultimate frisbee with us. My tone was clearly angry. I'm telling you, I just woke up. I didn't even know you were playing frisbee. Well, there was seven people fishing, and the teams were four on... I stopped dead in my own words. Did you ever go downstairs earlier last night? I quickly asked. No. I was out as soon as I hit the bed. I've been up late last... I stood up and stared, walking away in the middle of the sentence. I counted the people around the yard. One, two, three, four, five, six, myself is seven. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw a faint shadow near the tree like, but when I turned, the figure had walked off. Wasting no time, I jogged to Roy. I need to talk to you, trying not to alarm the rest of my news. Okay, speak. Again, wanting to waste no time, I spat out, I think there's someone else in this farm. He turned to look me dead in the eyes. He shot up from his seat on the grass and, and dragged me to the Honda van. And what are you basing this on? He questioned. Think about it. Someone came downstairs last night and everyone says it wasn't them. So? They could just be lying for some reason. I just talked to Joey. He just woke up. Hmm. You idiot. There were seven people fishing, he stopped abruptly. And after a long sentence, he continued. There was a face. I didn't recognize in the group, he scuffled, while staring at nothing. Without a second hesitant, he climbed into the back of the Honda and emerged again seconds later with a pistol in his hand. What the hell? Why do you have that? I was afraid what would, what would happen. I mean, they're probably thieves. So we need to be careful. Let everyone know what you told me and keep a sharp eye out. They could be dangerous. I walked back and made my announcement and counted heads. We had seven people right now. Good. Seven people. With the sun setting and cold setting in, Roy and a friend of his built a fire in the stone pit that we already built. After cooking some fish and everybody munching silently, Roy grabbed me and led me to the van again. He handed me a six pack of beer and carried another with his hands. I never drank much, so after a few sips I was done. With the remaining people, they were at various levels of drunkenness. When Joel suggested capture the flag, I headed off to the Suburban to grab the flashlights, and when I got back, everyone had lined up. Handing off one flashlight per person, I ran out before the last person. I ran back to the cars and searched for the last one. I know I brought seven. After being unable to find it, I concluded that I had lost it. I walked back to the group. Now I noticed everyone had a flashlight. Confused, I looked at the guy without one when I left and I asked him where he got it. Some dude handed it to me, he drunkenly responded. Who? Where did they go? I had a sense of real urgency in my voice. He handed it to me and then ran off in the forest. His eyes lit up when he realized what he had said. I told him to keep quiet and stay calm, but before I knew it, they were playing the game and not even searching for the extra person anyways. It wasn't but a few hours before people began picking off one by one to go to bed, and I was next to last to run in. I didn't even change clothes. I just walked in the room and flopped down on my bed, and before I knew it, I was dead asleep. I had no idea what time it was when I woke up with some drop hitting my face. Gazing at the ceiling, I noticed a fine leak, and of course, it was pouring rain outside. I turned to cover up the side of my head. When I did, I noticed the bedroom door was open. There was someone standing there in the door frame, as if they were walking in and shutting the door behind them, but froze mid-motion. Who's there? I shouted loudly enough to make my roommate hear. It maybe lingered for two seconds before it bolted. I heard thumping on the stairs, then the front door swing open. 
I flew out after it into the pouring rain, only to find out that I have been far outrun. I headed back in, shivering, not only because of the cold and bolted the front door shut, everyone stared at me. Whatever it is, it's out, so as long as all the doors and windows are shut and locked, we're safe, trying to reassure everyone. I seem to be the only one capable of speaking. After a few long minutes of thought, me and Roy looked at each other. The back door, we both said. We ran to the kitchen, but only in time to hear it slam shut. Now we didn't know where it was. It was only a few short seconds of staring when a scream came from the second bedroom upstairs. I was the first one up and froze at the doorway. It was leaning over Joel. It turned to me and lunged out the window. Roy darted past me and Joel, laying lifeless on the bed, blood dripping from his throat. I ran to Seth, who was completely curled up on the corner, still screaming. I finally got him to shut up in time to hear Roy. We need to leave now! No one wasted any time at that and everyone ran to the vehicle, scattered and frantic. I got in the car, along with Riley and Roy. A scream came out from the house and Roy immediately ran out the back house gun drawn. I scooted to the driver's seat and stared out the window. After minutes, I heard three gunshots and saw someone running out towards the Suburban. I took out my flashlight and shined it to see Roy's pale face and empty hands. I shined the light to reveal whatever it was chasing him. With the gun in one hand, I shined my light on it, but saw no face, no features. It was still a shadow. When it saw the light, it turned to me and began running at me. I slammed my foot up and the car grounded to speed. After ten minutes of driving in the dark, rainy fog, me and Riley, now the only ones in the Suburban, we stopped at the freeway. Riley wanted to keep going, but I was driving and elected to wait for five minutes for them to come up. Minutes went by and I grew more anxious and almost left, but before I saw a pair of headlights in the distance in my front mirrors. It was definitely the van and it was speeding right at us. It kept speeding. It didn't stop. There was a sudden slam, and in my recovery, me and Riley heard the radio kick on. You better drive. The voice was muffled, distorted. Riley and I screamed together as I stood on the gas. As we drove, the thing was constantly driving right behind us, riding our bumper, waiting for us to stop, a thought which didn't cross my mind until the low gas indicator stared going off. Listen, Riley, here's the plan. He turned anxious for ideas. In a few seconds, I'm going to slam the brake. Hold on, but quickly get out of the car, run into the woods. Once we get to a safe distance, we will loop around and get in the van, then we'll drive off. Make sense? He nodded quickly, and without a second thought, I pounded my foot on the brakes. We heard skidding behind us and took no time to get away into the thick forest. After several minutes, we decided it was about time to go back. So we circled around and ran back towards the freeway. When we arrived, both vehicles had doors open and no sign of the creature that had been chasing us. We got in the van, shut the doors, and began driving fast away from that horrible place. An hour into our drive, a new alarm started beeping. I looked at the dash, stopped the car, and froze. Riley was jerked away and stared at me. Whoa, what? I turned to him slowly. The trunk is opening.